guys, welcome to Woodwork Life. So today I'm building an industrial modern style table with a sweet gum top and some gold accents. Uh, this was a pretty cool project in a pretty unique style. So if you enjoy this design style or this type of build, be sure you get subscribed because I'm also building the matching set of waterfall benches in that same modern industrial style. Also, I shot this video a little bit different than some of my other tutorials. It's just sort of a series of tips and tricks that kind of gets the project put together. So I'll put some of the timestamps to some of those tips and tricks right here on screen. And uh, you can jump ahead to those if that's something that you're interested in. And uh, otherwise, let's go ahead and check out how we put this thing together. Like most of my projects, this one started out at my hardwood dealer. I go to this place called Lumber Logs. It's open up twice a month. They buy and mill trees from tree guys around the city to mill it up into nice usable lumber. I bought some beautiful 10 inch wide 8 quarter sweet gum planks to make the tabletop. First I had to flatten them and I wanted to use a router sled. So I had to flatten and level my bench to make sure that it would be a nice reference surface to flatten the boards with. If you're lucky like my buddy Caleb from You Can Make This Too, you can use your antique 16 inch joiner, but my joiner only goes to 6 inches so I had to find a way to make do. Once the top of my workbench was flat and I'd shimmed all the legs to get the surface level in all directions, I attached a couple of jointed boards to the edges. While I was doing this, I continued to check for level, and I used a combination square to check that the top of the board was equidistant from the bench all along its length. By doing this and ensuring that both runners were level with each other and equidistant from the top of the bench, I ensured that I had a coplanar surface to ride my router sled on. The boards are in pretty good shape and have pretty clear grain throughout the length of the wood, but they did have a few imperfections at the end, so I trimmed those off. There's no reason to do any extra flattening I didn't have to. From there, I made the most basic router sled I could think of. Well, actually, I started by making some complex Matthias Wandel style, like, dual parallelogram, router sled, whatever. And then I realized I wasn't Matthias, and really, when I make a jig, I make a jig that's just good enough for the job at hand. I don't usually make something where I'm going to use it over and over again. That might change in the future. The only critical component of this sled is just a flat bottom. So I use these long stretchers just to maintain the flatness so there's no bowing over the width of the sled. The maximum capacity of this is about 24 inches in this situation, but you could scale this up to make it a lot wider if you need to flatten a wider board. Before I get to flattening this with the router sled, I do need to stabilize this rock. So I know my bench is flat. I used wood shims and hot glue to affix it to the top of the bench. That way I knew it was stabilized against a reference flat surface. From there, I could set up the router sled and get after it. Carbide Processor sent me this amazing two and a half inch surfacing bit with uh, the two carbide teeth like you can see there. It's awesome for flattening panels and with the carbide teeth, if you ever dole it out, you can just rotate it a quarter turn and you're back to flattening. The key to flattening a wide board with one of these sleds is really just to work systematically in shallow, narrow passes. So with the two and a half inch bit, it gives me a little more wiggle room where I can go a little bit wider. And with the sharp carbide teeth, I can go just a little bit deeper than I normally would. But just reference off the high point of the board, set the bit to that, and then just go across the whole board with whatever bit you're using. This board was a little bit further out of flat than what I'm used to working with, probably just because it's so wide. And never worked with sweet gum before. Maybe it's not quite as dimensionally stable as some of the other species I've worked with. After releasing the board from the bench, it was time to flatten the other side. Now that I had a flat reference surface, I could use my drum sander or a planer or whatever tool you really want to, to get this to its final dimensions. Full disclosure here, and I don't want to disappoint any of you, but I have no idea how to weld. So I actually reached out to my buddy Andy, here's his Instagram page, go blow that up or whatever, and he put this together for me. This is just a simple square tube frame. Uh, I just had to clean up a little bit of the rust, and then I was going to hit it with a couple coats of gold spray paint. Uh, the customer, the client who actually commissioned this, really liked the idea of those like restoration hardware pieces of furniture with the gold accents on like the really nice like natural wood grain. So I tried to replicate that. But in a third degree shop, I had to plug in all the heaters just to get it warm enough to cure the paint. So back to prepping the boards for the tabletop, I made sure that my blade is at perfect 90 degrees, and I used this little trick I learned from uh, Caleb at You Can Make This Too. I attached a six foot level to the edges of my boards. That gives you a reference flat straight surface that you can then trim the other edge at your table saw. Because just like with flattening these boards, I needed something that was a little bit wider and a little bit longer support jointing these edges. So with that six foot reference surface against my table saw fence, it worked just fine. After that, I just had to trim these to their final width and I was ready to start gluing up the panel. 
I cleaned up the edges of the boards with the smoothing plane to get rid of the saw marks and also to get rid of any potential gap that I might see between the boards. Then I marked for biscuits. The biscuits aren't entirely necessary, but when you're working with two inch thick stock, it really helps to align things because they are pretty heavy. I could have used dominoes for this application as well. I went ahead and left those runners set up since I knew that was a parallel flat surface and I used some of my widest bar clamps to put the boards in between. That would have a nice flat surface to make sure that my glue up went together nice and smoothly and had a smooth flat surface. I was very liberal with the glue and made sure to get it inside of all the biscuit holes so that the joints would go together smoothly. Don't be like me, all you need to do is tighten the clamps until just a little bit of glue squeezes out the joint along the full length. I ended up over tightening these and I got a little bit of that potato chip effect, I believe that's a technical term. And that makes it a lot more difficult to smooth and flatten the tabletop surface later. I cleaned up as much of the glue as I could with a wet rag and then I scraped off any of the remainder with a hand scraper. After the tabletop came out of clamps, it was time to square up both edges. I used a combination square and my circular saw to square off both edges. I used my track saw, but you can do it just the same with a circular saw and a straight edge. My seven and a quarter inch saw didn't go quite all the way through with the track in place, so I used a Rayoba just to finish up the cut. This left a little bit to clean up with a plane, but that was quick work and didn't really affect the final results. I've released a full video on how to do classic breadboard ends. I'll link to that here. But Festool was nice enough to send me one of their dominoes for a future hand tool shootout. Be on the lookout for that. And I took the opportunity to try my hand at what I like to call cheater breadboard ends. What you do is you use floating tenons instead of integrated tenons. So you'll install the biggest domino you can use, add a little bit wider slot on the breadboard end so that it has room for expansion and contraction of the surface of the table. You'll mark and drill holes at the center, essentially, of where each domino will be in the edge of the breadboard end. This first hole will go all the way through. From there, you'll temporarily attach your breadboard end so that you can mark the holes that are going to go into those floating tenons you've previously installed. You're going to mark the holes at the center of each of the hole, but then when you go to drill the holes into the floating tenon, you're going to drill those about a sixteenth inch offset towards the tabletop. This is the same as installing a normal breadboard end, but you've cut out all the work of drilling all the mortises and cutting all the tenons. Now when you're drilling this offset hole, a trick to prevent you from having to do a bunch of filing and adjusting of the hole is just wiggle the drill bit a little bit. This will elongate the hole just enough so that you'll have room for expansion and contraction of the pins once those breadboard ends are installed on the tabletop. Just like with a classic breadboard, you'll want to sharpen your pins just a little bit so they'll help cinch that breadboard up against the tabletop. Then you'll gently pound in your pins. Gently. Again, here I used the Ryoba. This time as a flush trim saw, it works just perfect for this application. I used walnut pins because, well, I tried sweet gum at first and they just kept splintering. From there, it was time to trim the breadboards flush and start dealing with that potato chip problem I was talking about earlier. So between over clamping and just a really wet winter, I end up with a lot of warp in the tabletop between gluing it up and attaching the breadboard ends. So these weren't quite even. I looked at a bunch of different solutions on how to smooth out the surface, and the one that seemed the most quick and reliable was actually using a angle grinder with a flap disc. Now I, when I posted this on Facebook for the first time, a lot of people were really shocked about using a flap disc on wood, but all it is is sandpaper. You do have to be a little more careful with this because this does do a lot of shaping of the wood, but if you're just trying to remove some big areas, it's a fast way to do it. And now that we've got through the bulk of the material removal, it's time to just do regular sanding. So I took this through all the grits. I started with 40, moved to 80, and then 150, because I really wanted this thing to be nice and smooth. Now it didn't have to be machine flat, but I did want it to be flat enough where a glass wouldn't seem like it would tip over at all. So I made sure it was flat as I ch and I checked regularly to make sure it was within margin of flat. Another quick tip, and I actually took this one from Mark Spagnolo, the Wood Whisperer, is as you're sanding, just mark up really lightly with pencil just to make sure that you've covered all the areas as you're covering with sandpaper. I know, really exciting tip about sanding, but whatever. It'll save you a lot of trouble in the end. I moved the table outside for finishing. I just had too much sawdust flowing up through the air. I used Armor Seal's Oil and Urethane Top Coat, which is a form of polyurethane mixed with oil, to get a finish. 
This would pop the grain just a little bit more than a standard polyurethane, and it brought out some of the nice red tones and interesting grain structure inside this wood. It's beautiful finish. I put on three coats with a 400 grit sanding in between. That table turned out great. Uh, the client actually came by a couple days ago and they're stoked about it. I really enjoyed putting it together. It turned out great. Again, I'll be building the waterfall style t uh, benches that go along with that in the next couple weeks. So be sure if you're not subscribed already to hit that subscribe button. And if you are subscribed, uh, click that little notification bell icon so that YouTube will notify you when I release that video. Should be like another two or three weeks. Uh, a little housekeeping news as well. Um, if you feel like supporting me further, um, for my Patreon supporters, anybody that contributes at any level, I'm be providing measured drawings, written plans, just a bunch of different ways to build projects like this tool chest you see behind me, the table I built today, the miter saw station I built a little while ago. I'm going back through all my old catalog and just uploading those so that you guys can have access to those if you feel like building any of this stuff. Uh, thanks for supporting me, thanks for watching, and remember, keep your tools sharp and keep your mind sharper. Yeah.